Today the subject is that old serpent. And I looked around for pictures and I went, nah, I don't want to mess with your mind. <laughs> and I had this, this idea, and even for a reason, you notice there's kind of like this black shadow around the name and there's light behind, but it's kind of blocking the light. Okay, That's the graphic I wanted you to get out of this, is that Satan, his, one of his number one roles is to block the light. But that's not the only role. Let's see if this thing's going to work for me here. Look at that. First shot. I wasn't even going to put this in this text in. And then I, my conscience got to bother me because I knew somebody was going to say, well, why didn't you have Genesis 3 in there? Well, because I assume that most of you know this story. And if you don't, you can look it up and read it. But I want to pull a few things out of it. And... Uh, I hope you realize that Satan was there right at the beginning, right? And he's talked about right at the very end of the last book, a little bit there. And so just keep that in mind. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's a lot of uh, different doctrines out there about the devil. Some of them think that there is no devil, that it's just all an allegory. And uh, I want you to think about that as we're going through these texts. I want you to look at the different things that I've got highlighted. Also, just, just take the whole text in and see if you think that that's, that's really a possibility in this. Ask yourself this. If there really is no devil, if the, if the devil was really just symbolic of sin, why was there a third curse? There was curse on man, there was curse on woman, and there was curse on the serpent. If there really wasn't a serpent... Why the curse? Why punish all the other beasts that come after this one that seem to be the descendants of? Right? What does it say? On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all day. I'll put in between you and the woman and between your seed. Your seed? The serpent could have seed whenever the serpent was, had offspring. And of course, the whole idea of the bruising, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. There we go. I'm going to move pretty quickly through most of these texts because I have a lot of texts to cover today. You are of your father, the devil. Hmm. We just read something about some seed. And looks like when I'm reading this in context, Jesus is actually talking to the Jews that believed him. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks. I maybe should have highlighted that from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. If this is all an allegory, look at it. A murderer, a liar. He had desires. He speaks a lie. If this is just all an allegory of sin, does that really work? Romans 16, 20, we jump clear to the end of the, of the whole story for Satan here. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Hmm. In God's perspective, Satan was just a temporary nuisance. But what is he in our perspective? What is, is he in our world? 
These are the things we want to talk about. Things to look for. Is he real or an analogy? What is his goal? So what's he trying to achieve? And how does he work? So that's what we want to look at in this. 1 Peter 5, 8-9. A lot of us know this verse, right? But let's think about it from that aspect, those, those questions. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, he's an adversary, the devil walks about like a roaring lion. I could have highlighted walks too there, right? Seeking whom he may devour. All he can devour. And then the instruction to us is resist him. How do you resist him? By being steadfast in the faith. You don't have any faith in God. You don't have any faith in the salvation of God, the resurrection of the dead, in a life after this life. Why would you resist? Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. This morning in the adult class, we read how David fell into some problems, right? He can fall into problems, so can we. But it can be resisted, otherwise it wouldn't say it. Job 1. This is another text I was just going to refer to, and I ah, better read it, because somebody's going to say, why didn't you have that one? Job 1, 7 through 11, the Lord said to Satan, so, if this is true, God talked to him, or whatever it is, from where do you come? Ask him a question. If this was sin, and that was all, all it was, just figurative, just symbolic, or an allegory, uh, an analogy of some kind, why this kind of language? Why not just tell us? But where did you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, oh, so Satan can answer. He can talk. And said, from going to and fro, so he can do that on the earth, and from walking back and forth. Well, he can walk. He didn't say from slithering back and forth. So be careful what kind of mental image you put together of Satan. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. This brings up accuser. Okay, He's an accuser, but we have to work backwards in this. He's also a reasoner. Right? Isn't he reasoning? Okay. Zechariah. Zechariah has a vision. And this is what he sees in the vision. It says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Yeah, these people had just come back from, from a long time in exile, right? They're barely surviving in the land. Enemies all around them trying to stop them from surviving in the land. And what we see in this, in the vision, and I'll grant, if you're going to say that anything is figurative, this is probably it, right? But what we see is God is represented there by an angel. Joshua, the high priest, is there, and Satan's on the other side opposing. 
lesson in this, lesson in Genesis 3, he doesn't care about you. Nothing that he's suggesting you do, nothing that he's putting out to you as an, op as an option is for you. It's for him. It's all for him. He's an opposer, an accuser, a murderer, a liar. There is no truth in him. So we need to understand that everything he is doing and the suggesting that we do is so that he can oppose God, oppose you to oppose God, to try to change what's already been said is going to happen to him. And that bruising is crushing under the feet. Okay? Note, if you think back to what we read there in Romans 16, it's God that does it. Yet in Genesis it says that the seed of the woman was going to do it. Once again, this plays into the agency of Jesus. Right? Yeah. Okay. Luke 4. The temptation of Christ. There's a lot of things we need to think about in this. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, part of understanding Satan is understanding spirit. If you don't understand spirit, you're going to get all Hollywood and all messed up. Okay? You need to understand what Holy Spirit is. You need to understand what spirit is. It's a mentality. It's a mindset. It's a way of thinking. It's thinking itself. Now, it can be what you express when you breathe out and words come out of your larynx. It can be that. But that is all connected to what's going on in here. And there's a Holy Spirit, and there's the spirit of the world. There's lots of different spirits. That's why John said, try the spirit, test the spirit, see whether they're of God. There's lots of different ways of thinking. We can take in those types of thinking, either good or bad, into our thinking. We can integrate them into our mind. Jesus was integrating into his mind the thoughts that God expressed to him. Okay? God spoke to Jesus, his spirit came into Jesus' ears, mind, however he did that. Jesus took that in and integrated it, okay? He had a choice. That's another important thing to note in all this. You have a choice. I don't know that the donkey had a choice. I'm talking of the story of Balaam. I'm not sure the donkey had a choice. But the spirit still did something there, right? Because God's spirit is powerful enough to make something happen that by nature would not. So, filled with the Holy Spirit, he returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. So we're not told necessarily everything that goes back and forth between the devil up until the point where Jesus is real hungry. Did you notice that? There's 40 days that he's tempted by the devil, and then he gets really hungry, and the devil says to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. If there is no real devil, if it's just if it's just an, an allegory or an analogy, why would he say, what would be the sin in acknowledging that he could make bread? 
The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Is there some reasoning going on here? Now, some would argue, well, this was all just in Jesus' mind. Okay, but just keep thinking about all things we've talked about so far that it says of the devil. Then the devil taking him up on a high mountain. Hmm. Showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I suspect, I don't have the proof, but I suspect based on some facts that I don't know any, any mountain on planet Earth that will show you all the kingdoms of the world, okay? That he's seeing a vision. That Satan is able to put a vision in Jesus' mind, take him just like Ezekiel was taken to Jerusalem while he was still over there in Mesopotamia. Right? And shown all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. How much power did Satan have? And how could sin itself pull that off? And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory. For this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Is this just an analogy? Is this figurative? Therefore, if you will worship me, all will be yours. So he claimed authority. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. There's a vision for you. And said to him, If you are the Son of God, and I think he probably put him there, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. So apparently, sin has a, has a memory. Because if the devil is, uh, the word devil is only symbolism talking about sin, sin remembers what God said. Sin has a memory. I don't think so. And, he goes on, in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now I want you to think about something that James said. God cannot be tempted with evil. God cannot be tempted with sin. So if this is just sin, how could he say, you shall not tempt the Lord your God? Now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So he intended to come back. Luke 10, starting at verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, and yeah, you're, you're going to have to read it if you want to know the story of who the 70 was. 70 people that Jesus sent out to do ministry. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. 
and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you. Okay. So the spirits here has to be seen as equivalent to, equal to, tantamount to, whatever, the demons mentioned in verse 17. They're spirits. They're mindsets. They're ways of thinking. And he said, don't rejoice because you're subject to those, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Just things I want to think about, want you to think about. We're going to talk about spirits more in this next text, but think about what he said to them. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 7. And you he made alive, this would be God, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Okay, this is acknowledging that we all are sinners. And that before we came to the truth and accept the truth, we all walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. If a spirit is a mindset, a way of thinking, then what we're talking about is the way the world thinks, and that that is the spirit of the one who is the prince of the power of the air. So what he claimed to Jesus in the temptation, Paul is verifying. That Satan had been given authority over the kingdoms of the earth, all the kingdoms over time. And he was able in a moment of time to show that to Jesus and says, you can have all this, all the glory of it, and the power that comes from it, if you just worship me. And this maybe should help us understand something we're going to read in Revelation 13 here in a little bit. He says, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places, word places supplied, made us made to sit in the heavenly in Christ Jesus. Why is that important? Well, we're going to read some things in Revelation here in a few minutes that this text helps us understand. By coming to Christ, by coming to God through Christ, we become elevated. And if you remember what God said to the nation of Israel, especially in Exodus 19, right? He said, all the earth is mine. If you will do what I say, then I will make you above all the other nations. Okay? Above all the other nations. You'll be a special people, right? A royal priesthood. A kingdom of priests, it says in Exodus 19. Okay. Revelation 12, starting at verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old. So we have to pause there for a second and make sure you remember what we read in, in Genesis, right? That the serpent 
That's what we're talking about. That serpent of old, here called the great dragon. And I will suggest to you that my studies and my thoughts on Revelation, I come to the conclusion that the dragon is the dragon, is the dragon, is the dragon in Revelation. Okay, Kind of like the one on the throne is the one on the throne and is always the one on the throne. In Revelation, the one on the throne, when it says that, that's God. When it talks about the dragon, it's Satan. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. There's four named titles, right? Pretty well identified. And his angels. So he has messengers were cast out with him. Cast out of what? Well, if you look at the text before, I don't have it on there. I can't put all the context on for you. But if you look at before, there was war in heaven and the devil couldn't win. And he was cast out. Okay. Jesus said, when they were able to cast out demons, he said, ah, I saw Satan fall like lightning to the earth. The process of Jesus coming, standing up to Satan and the temptation, bringing the gospel to the world, people accepting it through the death of Christ, brought about the fall of Satan. Because his whole purpose was not to be your friend, but to bring you down. To defeat God's plan. That's his whole purpose, is to oppose, to accuse, and to oppose. It says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Now that's an assumption that someone does that, right? That makes them an overcomer. Continuing on. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. I'm going to pause here for a minute because... I want you to think about the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will is done in heaven. So when it's talking about war in heaven in Revelation 12, it's not talking about literally in the presence of God. It's talking about the realm of the people who are above. Okay? The people that rule over the governments of this world are in essence in the heavens. They've placed themselves. Read Isaiah 13, 14 and see if that isn't true. Because what it says in the prophecy about the king of Babylon and the king of Assyria and what they assumed of themselves, that they placed themselves in the heavens above the stars of God, They, called, they referred to themselves as stars. And we hear people referred to as stars, and do we understand what that means? They're a sports star, a movie star, whatever. That they're above and shining, a glorious one above the other people. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Does sin have great wrath? Because he knows. Does sin know that he has a short time? Oh, well, this brings us to something else, but I'm going to hold it for a second. When we get to the 20th chapter, remember this 
sin, he knows he has a short time. Is that sin? Or does sin happen even when the devil is bound? I'm getting ahead of myself. Now when the dragon saw, oh, he can see, apparently sin can see, that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Revelation 13, 2. I said we were going to have something, just one verse. You've heard of the beast, the mark of the beast, and we talk about that. But look what it says of the beast. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So apparently John agrees with, or really, this is Jesus speaking by an angel to John. Oh, but really it's God who gave the revelation to Jesus, who gave it to the angel to give to John. That's Revelation 1. That's the, the pecking order, right? And that spirit says, the dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. So when the devil said to Jesus, this authority I have, I can give it to whoever I want. And if we understand the beast to be the governments that are in place today, because they're there right till the stone strikes it in Daniel 2, then who's running the governments today? Who gave them their power? Who gave them their seat of authority? And do you want to vote for them? Do you want to have hope in that government? I would hope not. I would hope you, we can see the futility of involvement in government. Revelation 20. He laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent of old, or that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. If there's any question about who it's talking about, I don't have any more for you. That should be enough. And bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. Is there going to be sin in a thousand years? Otherwise, law is futile, right? There's laws in a thousand years. It talks about in Isaiah 65, right? The sinner will be considered accursed, right? Dying at 65. In order to have a sinner, somebody has to sin. So there's sin in the millennium, even though the dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan, is bound. So if this is symbolic of sin only, how can you have sin bound and still have sin? It logically does not work. Cast in the bottom of the pit, shut him up, set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more. Yeah, nations, not just people, nations till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little season. Now, when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. You think about that. What does it take to convince people that have been living for a thousand years with immortals over them? Immortals can't kill them, can't hurt them. What does it take to convince people you can overthrow them? Let's gather together and let's form an army and let's go take them out. 
sin? Is that what convinced them? Or is there some being with enough reasoning and a devious enough plan, an opposer, that says, you can do it. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them, that's pretty simple, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. One last slide. Isaiah 26, are you familiar with the chapter? It starts off at the beginning with the people of Israel going, yay, we have a good city again. That's what it's talking about. Judah and their capital city, Jerusalem, and it looks to be talking about the millennium. And then it's, he goes on talking in the middle of the chapter about, we haven't done very well. We were supposed to really produce as a nation, but all we did was bring forth wind. And then Isaiah says, but your dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. And we have that beautiful part there at the end of the chapter. The last verse of chapter 26 says, for behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will also disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. So we're looking here at We've come clear to the end of the thousand years, I believe, where God sends fire out of heaven to devour. And the second resurrection, where all of the blood that's in the earth comes out. And the very next verse, the beginning of chapter 27 says, In that day the Lord with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, Leviathan the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. And then the subject matter changes. Sometimes I wonder if maybe they shouldn't put that verse at the end of the 26th chapter. Satan is going away. But in the meantime, we have to deal with him. An accuser, an opposer, one who's looking not to our good, but to our destruction. Hope we keep these things in mind as we go through our lives. Let's close with a song. service today with song number 230. Look up these names.
Our loving Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your words of hope and promise which you have given us, for the record that you have given of those people that have lived and those people that have, have worshipped you correctly over the years as an example for us. We pray that we would follow that example and be found acceptable to you. We ask for your forgiveness when we fail, and we pray for all of your people for guidance and protection and comforting and healing. We do ask that you would send your son soon, and we ask for a place in your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name.